Hello and welcome back to this Damnful Idealistic Crusade. This video is an overall discussion about James M. Cain's 1936 original novel or novella of Double Indemnity, and of course its famous adaptation by Raymond Chandler and Billy Wilder for the 1944 film version of Double Indemnity, which has very much superseded Cain's original novel, which is now usually only viewed in the context of uh, Cain's bibliography and also comparing it to a his most famous work, The Postman Always Rings Twice. Studying these two sources is a crash course in film adaptation, and the screenplay by Chandler and Wilder is frequently one of the most studied screenplays of all time. It is frequently republished in print, as it is here in the second volume of uh, Chandler's Library of America collections, and with good reason, because it's one of the most exquisitely crafted and constructed screenplays. It's so well done that it reads like prose, of course, that befits it being co-written by Raymond Chandler, who couldn't make words boring if he tried to. But this whole process is, is so fascinating because Kane and Chandler couldn't really be more different if, if you looked for specific different examples. And they are two of the sort of big three of the, the names of hard-boiled writing that came out of pulp magazines, and the other being, of course, Dashiell Hammett. But uh, Kane and Chandler are diametrically opposed uh, in terms of their styles are completely different. Uh, Kane is closer to Hammett with his very swift, very terse prose style, but he's also more direct than even Hammett. So uh, Kane's best and most famous novels are, of course, very short and swift and to the point, and you just get sucked up into the movement of the plot and the despair of the characters. The Postman Always Rings Twice really got the ball rolling and is still his most famous novel, and Double Indemnity uses a similar structure and style, which has led a lot of people to merely say that Double Indemnity was cranked out quick because it was originally serialized in magazine form first, and it was done to cash in on the success of The Postman Always Rings Twice. But while it uses a similar framework and also has a central male and female that uh, gets together and she gets him to help do away with her inconvenient husband, the similarities really end there because when you read these two books, especially back to back, while they obviously have a lot of similarities, they're uh, quite different in tone and the central characters are very different in each. Whereas in Postman, it's characters who are desperate. Uh, they're also younger and they've had world experiences, but they're, they're also in a particular realm, they don't have as much of a sense of the world outside them. Uh, here in Double Indemnity, there's at least a little bit more of a worldliness, and we have the the Walter character, just like in the film, who has the air of seeming like he's seen it all and knows it all. Um, it just it feels a little bit more like a refinement of what Cain did in Postman. So I do think you can see a growth as a writer. And of course, Double Indemnity was published two years later. So, you know, obviously there's going to be a lot of similarities and it does build upon Postman. So I don't think you can look at Double Indemnity, the novel, without thinking about Postman Always Ranks Twice. So I think it's important to make that connection. But I also think it's unfair and frankly quite lazy to just write off Cain's Double Indemnity as just a... Uh, a, a quick rehash of Postman because it's it's not. Now, most people think the film version is completely different or just takes the key idea, but surprisingly, uh, quite a lot of Kane's dialogue is actually still in the film, uh, but it's also been tweaked and changed around. The story always went that even Kane himself admitted that his dialogue didn't sound well when people spoke it, and so when he was adapted for the screen, even when he adapted himself, they, they had to spend a lot of time trying to worry about how what what dialogue the actors were going to say because if they just read Kane's dialogue it would sound odd and and not natural. Um, I, I think there's some degree of that there, but I also think at that point in time, especially during the production code, you couldn't get away with the the vitality and the visceral quality that's in Kane's most famous works. I mean, that there, there's a reason why both Postman and Double Indemnity were pretty much banned by the production code from ever being adapted. So studios had bought these properties and they couldn't do anything. That's why it took the combination of Billy Wilder and Raymond Chandler to get Double Indemnity even through the production code. And they had to find out ways 
of making this story play within the confines of the code, but also to not lose and alienate the audience because you're dealing with a character that essentially murders someone who has never done anything to them, someone he doesn't even really know, and you have to find ways to not only inject maybe a little bit of humor, but have an, enough narrative drive and enough levity to keep your lead character likable so the audience never uh, loses that identification with someone who does a very terrible act. So it's fascinating if you only know the film to then go to the novel and see a lot of that same spirit is maintained and the, the structure is still there. It, the, the film still has Kane's framework and it has all the basic materials. But when you look at the various elements that Chandler and Wilder started working on and what they started tweaking here and there and this consistent tone of uh, almost a slight self-awareness, a, a, a certain levity and also a, a, a certain fleshing out of, of of the characters and uh, increasing the depth in some of the relationships and making our lead characters a bit more fleshed out, uh, that's where the film really starts to distinguish itself. Because if you look at the screenplay and you look at Kane's novel side by side, we see the same events, but the spirit and the tone becomes completely different in places. The characters in the film are much richer. The characters in Kane's novel are much uh, more direct and there's but there's also a rawness there and if you as the blurb on the back of most of the printing say no one ever stopped reading one of Kane's books well you really can't put it down and it's also so short at about 110 pages it's so swift that you get hooked in on the actual action and you're not necessarily questioning the ins and outs of things but also there's a rawness there that makes uh, the Walter character, uh, you know, because he's also directly narrating things, which they do keep for the film with the voiceover into the dictaphone, uh, that that does add an immediacy, and Chandler and Wilder kept and maintained that. But I think a lot of these key differences in tone come from Wilder and Chandler's sensibilities, and they themselves got on like oil and water and fought bitterly, but at least were able to hang on long enough to finish the script. And the result is a unique flavor that is a blending of Wilder's acerbic sensibilities and Chandler's outsider worldview. So while you can see elements of his iconic Philip Marlowe in the film version of Walter and the voiceover and in the incredible dialogue, You've also got Wilder there as a counterbalance, and Wilder always favored having a co-writer, and if you look at Double Indemnity, it's unique in his filmography because the flavor is so specific. It's such a unique combination of Wilder and Chandler that it stands out compared to the Wilder partnership with, with Charles Brackett and the later Wilder partnership with IAL Diamond. Uh, there's, there's a unique flavor there that... I'd say only really gets echoed in Ace in the Hole in 1951, which is the bleakest film Wilder ever made. And in fact, it was so bleak that it bombed at the box office and that meant Wilder couldn't go that dark again until really 1960 in The Apartment. And even that was nowhere near as dark. But Double Indemnity remains unique for that particular pairing and the way that Wilder and Chandler's styles meshed and they, they at least found some common point in an outsider's view with a sort of acerbic cynicism that, that, of course, never loses that dash of romanticism that makes Chandler's prose and his character Philip Marlowe so unique. So there is a bit of Marlowe in Walter in the film, and you don't have that necessarily in Kane's novel. You also don't have the same name. That was one of the things they changed that I think was a, a very smart move. It seems like a minor thing, but in Kane's novel, it's Walter Huff and Phyllis Nerdlinger, and they do away with the inconvenient Mr. Nerdlinger. Um, all the other names stay pretty much the same, but that was one change they made, which I think was a great idea because those names don't stick out so much as being a, a little bit awkward, especially when you have to say them. Uh, so I, I think that was that was a good change. But again, you have so much more depth in Walter, and you have more depth than Phyllis, uh, who is a bit more one-dimensional in, in the book, and also doesn't appear all that much. And while a lot of Kane's dialogue is retained in the film, it's also moved around, and you have the brilliant 
Chandler approach to the English language throughout, which results in most of the iconic moments from the film. But also some of them are still Kane, so you do have to keep that in mind, that they aren't just throwing Kane out entirely. Wilder and Chandler are reworking and refining and distilling and adding and enriching Kane's framework, but they are keeping big passages of his dialogue, but not necessarily always in the same order. They also tighten up a number of things, and that leads to the final act of the film, which is entirely different in its ending, uh, as Kane basically has a an ending that is it's it's a bit perplexing the first time you read it and then eventually you get it on a sort of thematic level but it also seems completely impractical and uh, totally unrealistic and i'll put big spoiler notes up here for those who have not seen the film or read the novel um, but if you've seen the film then this will just entice you to read the novel uh, but in kane uh once the crime is confessed uh, because there's the added bit of the suspicion is now on uh, the characters of Lola and Nino Sagetti. Uh, Walter Huff and Kane, of course, confesses to Keyes that he is the murderer. He does it on his hospital bed where he's recovering from being shot by Phyllis, who he did not actually kill. She got the one up on him. And essentially, the insurance guys go and confer with Keyes, and they come back, and they basically say, well, we're going to wait to report this. We're going to give you a steamship ticket and we want you to just get out of here. But uh, once the, we turn this over to the police, then, you know, you're, you're on your own. If they ever find you, then you'll be prosecuted and likely executed. But we want to try and downplay this. So here's a steamship ticket. Don't ever call us again. Get the heck out of the country. That's what they do. But uh, they all Keys gives this little extra note of, you know, it, you, you might find it interesting. So, of course, uh, Walter Huff gets on the ship and runs into Phyllis Nerdlinger, who is there. Uh, and this is sort of a thing that Keyes must have rigged up because apparently he thinks that um, Huff is is pretty much just going to uh, what, what he needs to do is just go off and commit suicide. And so that's essentially the kind of pact they make. And the ending is literally the the two of them getting ready to jump over the, the, the side rail of the ship where they've seen uh, a bunch of sharks circling around. So they see the fins in the water. And in another bizarre touch of the book, uh, Phyllis has another uh, sort of little monologue at the very end to mirror a slightly earlier one where... Uh, she's apparently fascinated with death and sees herself as a physical manifestation of death itself, uh, which is a, a, a little bizarre. And she also puts like a certain costume on for their final act to go kill themselves. It's it's very weird the first time you read it, but it took me a number of years to realize that I guess what Kane was trying to suggest is that they were doing this and so they'd be swimming with sharks, thus sort of thematically swimming with their own kind because they themselves view each other as sharks going about society or or something like that um you know it, it it's it's still a very odd ending and that that is the the biggest thing that is changed in the film and the number one thing that is an improvement so in the film of course we end with uh keys played by eddie t robinson uh, finding walter neff and getting the actual story and then uh, walter trying to leave and collapsing at the door and we have the famous conclusion of their character arc as manifested in the lighting of the matches and the line I love you too which has been repeated multiple times and and formalizing and finishing and letting you know that that father-son dynamic is the heart of the film and that is of course the perfect place to close it however originally they did shoot the scene where Walter is executed in the gas chamber with keys looking on and then walking out into the bright sunlight um, absolutely a, a shattered and broken man that would have been a great scene but it I can see why they trimmed it and you read about it and it would be amazing to ever be able to see this. All we have are stills, but I can understand why Wilder felt the need to cut it. And also it might've had something to do with it being obviously made during world war two. And just the connotation of a, of a gas chamber was, was, 
you know, obviously not in not in good taste. It also probably would have been seen as too gruesome for American audiences. Uh, ironically, that ending they wrote originally is similar to the ending of Post Noir's Rings Twice. So, you know, that, that it kind of echoes there rather interestingly. And it's funny that it was Wilder and Chandler who came up with that. But it was a good ending because it ended with the same theme that the the ending we have has. It was just a final grace note because in the original ending, Keyes walks out and absentmindedly reaches for a cigar and reaches for the match, which of course he doesn't have. And just that action, the script describes it uh, in a beautiful final paragraph of the look of horror that comes on Key's face when he realizes what, what, what he's just done and that... He's now in, invoking the spirit of a dead man, uh, of, of, of the, the, the person who he viewed as a son of sorts and who betrayed all of that relationship and just the emotional turmoil he's going through. So essentially what they did by removing that ending is just making the more succinct version that was not intended to be the original ending. So um, obviously, had they decided this before shooting the gas chamber scene, that ending we have would have maybe had a little bit more breathing room in terms of it not being so slightly compacted. But that that is the perfect point to close the film out on because it's a more succinct version of what that whole gas chamber sequence was, was doing. It basically was saying the same thing, and Billy Wilder rightly recognized that they already said everything they had to say and to just cut it there. Outside of the ending, the number one difference between between the Kane novel and the film Double Indemnity is the complete reinvention of the character of Keyes, who is the heart of the film. And Eddie G. Robinson plays that role to the hilt in what is, I think, probably the performance of his career, as Fred McMurray and Barbara Stanwyck do with uh, both Walter Neff and Phyllis Dietrichson. But Keyes in the book is much more of a background figure, and he is the figure that Walter is worried about, obviously, of catching on. But Keyes doesn't become a real player in the story until the very end when Walter actually confesses to him. And you get a tinge of him having a sort of heart and humanity and a character, but otherwise he's been described as the cold numbers man, the ultimate policy guy, the man who's lived and breathed insurance his whole life and doesn't think about anything else. Um, we have that reflected in the film, but in the film they've actually given him a character. They've actually given him a heart, and Keys in the film really is the film's soul. He is the... the the father confessor, as he says at one point. Uh, and interestingly, in the film, because they do this with Keyes, they pick up on an element of Cain that doesn't often get discussed, the sort of attempt uh, in both Postman and Double Indemnity and other Cain works. The central character, once things are spiraling out of control and they're, they're in just constant anxiety and, and a feeling of paranoia, they usually have, at least for a brief moment, they, there's like a way out, where the, or, or they see something or they encounter someone who represents a sort of heavenly alternate universe existence where the type of life they would have if everything went right. In the novel, it's Walter's interactions with the daughter Lola, who is also in the film, and there's a suggestion that, you know, maybe they could have a relationship, and Walter likes her, and she likes him, and there's something that develops, and it allows Walter to have some moments of peace and relaxation, while knowing deep down that, you know, he's done this horrible thing and killed her father, and he wants nothing anymore to do with Phyllis, and also that... Lola is significantly younger than him and also is is a bit of an innocent in terms of that. I guess that's part of the attraction there is that uh, she she is a sort of um, a representation of of purity, if you will, a sort of ideal. Um, but that is much more expressed in detail in Kane's novel. And it is expressly said that Walter does fall in love with Lola in the novel. And she represents that sort of. Um, uh, that that sort of relationship he was looking for it's just that he chose the wrong person or didn't wait long enough before he chose someone to partner with in Phyllis but in the film there's also the uh, scene with Keys coming in and offering Walter a job with a cut in salary to work in his department work side by side as a claims man and that presents essentially along with the possible relationship with Lola later on 
both of those represent the life Walter should be leading and the alternate universe where he's a happy, fulfilled human being who enjoys what he does because basically being a claims man like Keys and sifting out all of the false claims or people like Phyllis would be his calling in life, what he's not doing, and, and that would be the fulfillment he's searching for. But instead, in both book and film, he makes the wrong choice because he senses a possible fulfillment in carrying out this murder scheme and crooking the system that he's uh, thought about for years, just sort of daydreaming about what it would be like to, to crook the insurance system and make off with a bunch of money because he seemingly knows all the ins and outs as an insurance man. But the film picks up on this, I think, and injects that into Keys. And also this furthers the father and son dynamic that you don't get in Kane. So I think the biggest single improvement that Chandler and Wilder did was the Keys character. And that is the biggest night and day difference. It's even greater than the ending because if you had Keys in the film as we have him, and you you, you could even somehow have the Kane ending if you wanted to. Maybe not as melodramatic, but you could even envision Keys in the film coming up with some scheme to give Walter a way out. So I, I, I think that ultimately the number one greatest a thing that Chandler and Wilder brought to Kane's story, the real masterstroke of the film Double Indemnity is the complete reinvention and refinement of the Barton Keys character and building that father-son dynamic between Keys and Neff. And in doing this, they knew they could humanize Walter to the point of having the audience get actually worried that he is going to carry out this scheme. And then when he does, being worried for him and getting the audience on the side of the murderer without thinking about it. And then in the aftermath, being worried about what's going to happen to this person who has committed a heinous crime because we've actually come to like this character and associate with this character. And we know full well that if this comes out and, and is discovered, this will not only obviously destroy Phyllis and Walter, you also have to look at the collateral damage of what this will do to Lola's emotional state. But most of all, what is this going to do to Barton Keys? And of course it shatters him. It's not as apparent without the original gas chamber ending, uh, but we get that feeling perfectly stated in the ending of the theatrical version that is so unbelievably iconic. And by ending on that, that final discussion between Keyes and, and Walter Neff, it once again underlines that that is the central relationship in the film, whereas in Kane, you don't have that. It is the relationship between Walter and Phyllis that has at least... A bit more focus in terms of characterization i think the the one that depends most on the actual performance is phyllis because uh, she appears least in both the novel and in the film version and of the three lead characters of walter keys and phyllis it's phyllis who is the least drawn and the most mysterious so it's Stanwyck's performance and Wilder's direction of her performance and Chandler injecting uh, more of a nefarious quality into this character that makes Phyllis really come to life. Whereas in Kane's novel, she's more of the catalyst for all this stuff to unfold. And then it becomes a bit like uh, Postman Always Rings Twice in terms of once the deed is done, things start to unravel, and then you just have two people who who can't really be around each other anymore. So this is echoed in the film, but there's a lot of subtext in Stanwyck's performance and especially Wilder's direction, and there's a lot more nuances and sides to Phyllis's character in the film, and you can see how she's trying to use different personas and put on acts to influence those around her to essentially do her bidding, and she essentially is performing in each and every scene and modulating her outward appearance and her persona for whoever she's dealing with. And she even does this for Nino Sacchetti, which we don't see in either the film or the book, but we know that she's been playing him to the hilt in the way that she has played Walter. And we know that she's been playing Walter to some degree. We just don't know how much until the film unfolds further or the book unfolds further. The real distinction here, once again, is that you have Raymond Chandler working on the screenplay and you have Raymond 
Raymond Chandler going in and reworking and rewriting James Cain, who was completely opposite to Chandler. And Chandler did not have the greatest opinion of Cain's work, but I think he he recognized that Cain could come up with a solid structure and a great jumping off point and had all of this raw energy there in his best works, which Double Indemnity is certainly one of them. But Chandler would be the one to come in and refine it and put his own spirit into it. And that's that magical quality that makes audiences come back to the film Double Indemnity with that wonderful recognition of the sardonic and and the humor. And it's what makes us smile at all the one-liners in Chandler's incredible grasp of the English language but it's it's like a super version of of that because it's Chandler getting to rework Kane so you have one of the big three of the hard-boiled writers getting to rewrite and rework one of the other of the big three but in his own style but on top of that working with Billy Wilder who is in my opinion probably the funniest man who ever lived working with the funniest writer who ever lived and both of them had a bitter, sardonic view of the world with quite a lot of societal criticism. And this is inherent throughout Double Indemnity. You get a little bit of it in Kane's novel, but since the novel is much rawer, it, it, it doesn't, it, it's much more subjective. Well, in the film, it's infused in everything. And this plays in to the Walter character in the film being so disgusted with himself and feeling empty and we get this stated in Kane, but we don't quite feel it as much because Walter isn't as well drawn. He's not as dimensional. It, 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 again, it's this quality of the film refines every element. The film refines it even on a visual scale with John Sight's photography and, and Wilder's staging. So every element of the film enriches what Kane already laid down. So when you have Kane's dialogue being used, it, it makes sense that it's still there, but Chandler and Wilder essentially did not miss a single trick in terms of how to perfectly find the point that Kane was making and try to keep that energy to give a sense of narrative drive so people were just hooked into the story. And Wilder wanted to, as he said, out Hitchcock Hitchcock. He wanted to make a grand suspense thriller, not necessarily a crime story. So it's a sort of fusion of genres. And this became crystallized in the film we have and its success and success in the industry is what led to the sort of floodgates opening for the genre we now call film noir. So Double Indemnity, the film kind of picked up the ball that the Maltese Falcon set down in 1941. Um, and similarly to what John Huston did on the Falcon, Chandler and Wilder distilled what Kane did and they enriched it and they made it slightly more mythic as John Huston did on the Falcon, but they also enlivened it with their own personal sensibilities. And it's that collaboration that is so incredibly unique that makes Double Indemnity absolutely a standout. And that is the real reason why it's one of the most iconic and one of the greatest films ever made. So it is a fascinating comparison to make between the film version of Double Indemnity and James M. Cain's original novel. Both are excellent examples of their respective genres, and Cain's novel has been overlooked for so long and also gets written off as a, just a rehashing of Postman Always Rings Twice, which is unfair. It is a great book. It is, a, I think, an essential read, and it's a perfect companion piece to the Postman novel and the film Double Indemnity. And if there was ever an example to understand the craft of screenwriting, uh, you, it is the Double Indemnity screenplay. That's why it's been reprinted and anthologized so many times. You can literally take Kane's novel and the screenplay and put them down side by side and read the pages at the same time. I've literally done this. It's just about the best explanation of what a great screenplay does to keep the same spirit of the book alive but enliven it with other voices to just really just make it live and breathe in in the mind's eye and make it resonate even more but never lose the original spirit of the original work but 
to add your own uh, spirit to it, to to enrich it. That's what Chandler and Wilder did. That's why the screenplay is still used to this day as one of the most analyzed scripts of all time. It's one of the very few scripts you can literally sit down and read the text, and it is a legitimate great text. It is a great piece of prose, right down to the scene descriptions which are maintained. So I, I encourage, I strongly encourage people to actually sit down and read the screenplay of the film itself because there are even one or two little tweaks that Wilder made. There's a, there's a tiny little bit of material, like, like maybe two little passages that you'll find exclusive to the screenplay that are maybe a little bit more Chandler flavor. And so you can even look at what the film did and what the performance did and what Wilder did with his direction and what Sites did with his photography to slightly tweak things from the page to then make it play in motion and make it play in the film. So... Double Indemnity is one of the best films you can possibly ever study and just it being one of the greatest films ever made, but also to study the screenplay, studying the adaptation process and studying Kane's original novel and see how all of this grew and grew in a natural way. All of this will make you just marvel at the genius of, of Chandler and Wilder and make you wish they had been able to get along long enough to maybe work on a second film. It is one of the great collaborations in films. It's one of the great collaborations in art because, in my opinion, it's a collaboration between two of the greatest artistic minds in all of human history. But I may be biased on that as I'm a Wilder obsessive and Chandler is my favorite author of all time, who I consider the greatest author in all of English literature. But... I'm biased, I admit it. Um, but Double Indemnity remains unique, and it is a fascinating text to study in all of its forms. And also how this plays back into Postman Always Rings Twice, because ironically, everybody likes to accuse Double Indemnity of rehashing Postman and the literary side of things. But it was Double Indemnity, the film getting made, that actually finally got postman made two years later in the 1946 mgm film version uh, basically double indemnity blew open the doors and mgm finally found a way to get postman made because they had bought it you know back when the book was popular in 1934 and they had to sit on it and of course the only way they got that film made was to water down kane's text so much that it hardly resembles itself in tone it is a mgmized version of Kane's iconic and best novel. That's one of the reasons why that story has never been done justice on the screen. It's a lot harder to adapt. Wilder was desperate to make Postman. He wanted to so badly, but because he couldn't, that's why he turned to Double Indemnity, which has a lot of the same problems, but it was Wilder and Chandler who figured out how to lick those problems and to also keep the audience sympathy and downplay elements enough to get it past the production code. Postman is much more difficult because the characters are much more unlikable on the surface and the story is even raw and there's much greater sexual content throughout the book, which honestly, you don't really have so much of in Double Indemnity outside of at least one instance in both the novel and in the film where it's alluded to that Walter and Phyllis do sleep together. But interestingly one of the one of the real genius aspects i think of double indemnity in both versions is that sex is not the motivating factor between walter and phyllis it's walter recognizing a similar spark of cynicism and intelligence in phyllis that's the connection the the excitement is in crooking the system of beating the insurance game and making off with the money that's the excitement that's what drives them. It's not sex at all. And that becomes very apparent once the actual act is carried out. And not only can they not see each other, they don't want to see each other. That's why when uh, certain people or say Richard Schickel in his commentary on the film say that there's not enough sex in the film. That's why I'm kind of sitting there screaming because sex is not the point. Sex is merely a side benefit. It's a fringe benefit, if you will. That's not what they're interested in. That's not what motivates these characters. So again, there are a lot of differences in Postman, but I, funnily enough, it was Double Indemnity being successful as a film that allowed MGM to finally get a film version of Postman made. But the only way they could do it was to water it down so much that it barely resembled the original work in tone. And again, 
nobody has ever licked Postman on on film. No one's ever done it justice. The 1981 film is a train wreck, um, which also changes Kane's ending. And I, I, I hate that film. I can at least appreciate the 1946 film. Uh, if you can't tell, I've, I've always wanted to try and do Postman myself as a film version. But the only way to do it is to follow in the footsteps of Chandler and Wilder and figure out a way to adapt the book not lose Kane's spirit or his tone, but to build upon it because his books are very swift and short and figure out ways to not lose the audience sympathy because you're dealing with two murderers. So once again, you have to look at what Chandler and Wilder did. And that is why this film and this this book, the story remains timeless. It's it's still a story that could happen today in, in various ways. And it's never lost that that an incredible appeal to to anyone who loves a good crime story. But it, it, it is just an incredible work to study in all of its forms. And I absolutely encourage anyone interested to dig deeper and take another look at the film, but also look at the screenplay and look at Kane's novel and also Postman as well. You know, look at this whole world of, of how uh, Kane's work was taken and transformed into the film we adore in 1944 and just study the whole process because... Again, there's probably no greater example of what great screenwriting is than Double Indemnity, and it remains one of the best scripts ever written. It is so perfectly crafted, so concise, but so full of depth and meaning and social criticism and genuine human emotion. It is a perfect coming together, again, of two of the greatest artistic minds of the 20th century. And that's why I felt the need to talk about Kane's novel, the adaptation process, the genius of Chandler and Wilder, and the masterpiece 1944 film in greater detail. So as always, I hope my babblings on classic films, film noir, Chandler and Wilder, Double Indemnity, and the wonderful world of hard-boiled fiction has been at least somewhat fun and informative. Uh, if you've ever dug deeper or looked at some of the uh, different versions, essentially, of Double Indemnity, I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Or if this inspires you to finally look at some of these other materials, I would love to hear your reactions in the comments. So as always, please do keep supporting both studios, boutique labels, and also publishers by buying classic works in, on both physical media and and in print book form, and of course, supporting independent bookstores wherever possible. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching.